Okay, now I start running this simulation and try to explain what's going on here. As you see, the first tank starts filling. Now water coming here. The first tank starts filling. Then now outlet is taken. It, it starts to be taken when you, we um, exceed four centimeters high. And we have the outlet here. These uh, kind of give you, uh, I had tried to do with those flowing effect so that you can see there's something going on here. It's, it's water flowing here. And the, the second tank also starts to be uh, filled also. Now it's about five centimeters six centimeters, you read this line here, right? Whereas these are given just to give you a three-dimensional perspective. Anyway, so what do we read here? First of all, uh, the outlet flow here is, is at constant value, one liters per centimeter here. And I have, uh, there is no, I assume no measurement noise is uh, on the outlet flow rate. So we assume that it's a perfect measurement. In real life, even this is not a perfect measurement, but just for the sake of this virtual experiment, let's take it as it is. On the other hand, both of the height measurements, there are some both measurement errors here and also some uh, disturbances. And where does this disturbance come from? Inlet flow rate. Now, as you can see, inlet flow rate is not equal to 2.05 liters per second. It was supposed to be that value, but due to variations in the process, it changed from time to time. And you can see the time here, time uh, runs a little bit faster compared to real time, just to make the whole thing a little bit less boring. So we start feeling, as I said, these processes. Now we can see here the graph of inlet flow rate, each sample with dotted dots here, with blue dots. So the inlet flow rate 2.05 here is written here. The heights of the two tanks are also recorded here. Now, as you can see why I call this a bit noisy processes, right? They are not exactly very smooth line. And I try to kind of simulate both the, the, the there may be, uh, uh, as I said, uh, perturbations in the disturbance variable here. And there may be some um, uh, uh, inaccuracies with the measuring devices. There's going to be always inaccuracies. And due to turbulence or things like that, there may be other factors which is uh, going to prevent uh, a very 100% uh, accuracy uh, impossible. So it's not going to be, there's going to be always some noise in the process. As I said, I would just uh, would like to give you the outlet flow rate here the, uh, with no noise. And it is uh, one liters per second. For, for the initial time, it was zero because up to this point, the height of the first tank uh, did not reach four millimeters per centimeters. That's why uh, the, the outlet flow rate here through those pipes, the manipulated variable uh, value was equal to zero. So in a way, this graph is the outlet flow rate is the manipulated variable, whereas this red line is the controlled variable trajectory. And this blue line is the intermediate hidden variable in between. So if you are only interested in manipulated variable uh, and the, the controlled variable here, you would not be monitoring this value possibly. But actually it is through this variable uh, which uh, makes this whole process possible. But this is the case for all the higher order uh, processes. There is an input variable u and you are usually interested in some high order uh, state variable, which is equal to the measured or the controlled variable, process variable, but also the other states uh, are also there. Anyway, one important point here in those question, uh, first of all, uh, before that, let me talk about these points here. Now, why is the startup of the process is complicated? Uh, as I said, this may involve a couple of stages here, for instance, it consists of even this very simple process consists of two stages here. Until four centimeters, there was no outlet, so a different set of out, uh, differential equations, well actually the same differential equations, yet still the, the outlet flow was equal to zero. And when we reach the, exceed this four centimeter value, we have a non-zero flow which is equal to one liters per second. 
So there may be a very simple case here, but even for this simple case, startup consists of two um, cases, two, two step stages, I may say, because we would not be able to give an outlet flow rate when the, the tank is totally uh, empty. So we should wait until some water is already in the tank. So just like this very simple example, startup are difficult or more involved, I may say. And in many cases, different control procedures and more complicated control strategies are employed. So is our experiment about startup of the process? No, it's not about startup of the process. I just want to show you how we reach a steady state and operating value. Now, um, since if you recall, our steady state, our operating value here was at one liters per second when input value is equal to one liters per second. We calculate, so we know from experience that steady state value is 21.7 centimeters. We expect that this is going to be the case. And one point, uh, another important point here is in real life, this startup is also achieved by controllers. As I said, this here is in an open loop banner. We know that we say that when we open this valve outlet flow rate at one centimeter and liters per second, we know that the process will reach here 21 point whatever centimeters. Well, in real life, you cannot guarantee that. So we would be uh, using controllers and the control surges, as I said, is going to be a little, a little bit more uh, complicated. But here we can see a first instance of an open loop process. So this exponential like behavior that you can see here is should come no surprise, but note that this is still different from what you have done in process control, of course. In process control, which we are going to do in our experiment in a couple of minutes, we go from one steady state value to another one. Here we have started from the empty tank. So this is a startup period. Nevertheless, this still gives you an idea. Now, one important point here is that in most of the experiments, we don't draw these figures online, these uh, readings. When you just read these values here, is it easy to see whether a system has reached steady state or not? So let's take a look at this value, just this value. Well, this slightly moves up and down. Down is, as I said, due to the noise of the system, due to the disturbances here in the inlet flow rate or other factors uh, transmitted to this value here. Can we, for instance, guarantee that at this moment, have we reached steady state? Now, just looking at the instantaneous values or even a couple of values, reaching the state state is very easy, very difficult to see. And uh, that's why a, a figure such as this one, a time response is almost um, uh, uh, indispensable, or uh, I should say that we need a figure, a time trajectory like this, not only to, to, to monitor the time trajectory, but to see whether uh, steady state it has been reached. Now you can see that for both of the tanks, which should be for both of the tanks, especially if uh, actually if the first tank hasn't reached the steady state, the second tank, of course, shouldn't have reached the steady state. And they are close to steady state values. So from now on, we are going to be probably be seeing very small fluctuations there. And as we can see, we are very close to 22 centimeters, which is very close to the 21.7 centimeters, our operating point here. So we can say that more or less uh, we have reached uh, or uh, our uh, process has, uh, oops, I think my system has crashed, but I guess you can steal the figure. Yeah, okay. Let it run. our system has more or less reached steady state. But a time trajectory, as I said, is quite indispensable in obtaining whether steady state is reached or not. Let's try to analyze this, what's going on. First of all, there was an increase in blue line. Why? Because it was totally empty, the first tank, and we started filling this first tank. And as you can see, there is a pretty much large time lag to, for the second tank. Why? It is because of the reason I tried to explain. Instead of this pipe, if we had just an opening, 
the height of the water will directly turn into without any any dynamic behavior velocity will instantaneously be formed here and will will be uh, forming the, the outlet from the first tank to the inlet of the second tank in this case of course there's going to be still this is going to be a second order behavior there's going to be a time lag but not maybe as much and then let, let's try to analyze from where we left um, this result here. Now, at the, I stopped this simulation at 600 seconds. In real life, what would happen is, I'm going to show what would happen next. This thing will continue once it's reached steady state. Now we are reached steady state, and we are going to continue this, this operation as long as there is no um, perturbation to the system. What do I mean by that? This perturbation may be an outside perturbation. Well, by the way, please note that still we don't have uh, feedback control here, which is the unrealistic case. So as long as there is no um, uh, a, a major disturbance to the process, and as long as we don't want to change these H values, especially the second height value, which is the control variable here, uh, the, the, the process variable that we are interested in, this is going to continue forever without the need for control. That is the idea, but in real life and especially, and also here in this example, we are going to be using control as I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. I hope. But before that, let's analyze these figures. It, it tell, tells us a couple of things here about the dynamics of the process. Again, remind you, reminding you that this is not the step change we, you have obtained in CHE 475 course. Now, this is a very important point because in that course, you have always obtained uh, changes from other steady state values to another one. So uh, visiting once from going one steady state value to another one. Here, we, we this is the start of the, of the process. Therefore, it may consist of different dynamics here. And here, this is really indeed those like this still, it is different dynamics. It still it, it gives us some information about the process. First of all, um, although this blue line seems like the so-called exponential recovery curve, which is the response of the first order system, actually it is not. Well, actually you need a little, little bit of experience for that, but exponential curves uh, um, approach faster to, to steady state values. And there is a more uh, an easier way of seeing that Actually, you can find the tau value, time constant of a first order process by a couple of methods. One of them is the, the point where you reach 63% uh, of the steady state value. Uh, the time at which you reach 63% is, is, is equal to the time constant. So basically, it is going to be somewhere here, 63%. So let me first write here. Uh, here. Ah, okay, not very bad. It will be crowded, but I can make it, yeah, look nicer. So this last point is about, I'm sorry, I don't need that. Let me get rid of this, this one, delete. I just would like to read this value here. So it's going to be about, yeah, 24.88. So this is somewhat like the steady state value, although we have the, 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 the noise here. So 24.88 times 63, 15.67 uh, is going to be somewhere here, I guess. Yeah, maybe a little bit on the right hand side. Let me get rid of this one. Yeah, somewhere here. Pretty much close. So this occurs at time is equal to 40. So therefore, tau is approximately equal to 40 if this were an exponential process. So basically, another way of thinking about tau is uh, actually, five tau is when you reach 99% of the steady state value, which is practically steady state value. So five times this tau value should be equal to 200, 
So therefore, practically, we should have reached steady state here. Let's see. However, the value that we reach is 23.73. Compared to the steady state value, which is 24.88, I guess it was this value, this is 95%. If this were an exponential process, that's why I would like to say that exponential uh, recovery curves approach the asymptotic value faster. This actually process slows down as it uh, reaches, as it seems to reach the steady state value. And this is due to the reason I tried to explain earlier. This, there is an additional resistance here which makes this process uh, a little a little bit, not too much, but, but a little bit nonlinear, which is uh, difficult to pronounce at least for me. Anyway, so what would, should I, ah, okay. The, the other point that I would like to talk about is I had taken 60, uh, under 600 seconds uh, of samples from that process. Now I know that from experience or when I uh, uh, write the uh, uh, modeling equations, I can also adjust that, but in real life, you, we would not be knowing the 600 seconds or maybe 500 seconds would also be pretty much sufficient. Let's see, maybe even 400 seconds. Well, actually all the values now pretty much graphed up. Let me look, look, look nicer. So even 350 seconds would be pretty much sufficient if you look from this red value, let's see, 21.74 and this is, Went from, yeah, 350 seconds would be sufficient. Again, recalling that this is not a, a, a perturbation from steady state value. So this is not exactly the response that we are after. Still, it, it gives us some idea about the dynamics of the process. Uh, so 600 seconds seems to be sufficient for this process, even lower values, maybe for step changes, this may be um, uh, sufficient. And a last point that probably you have uh, not thought about before is the sampling interval. The point is, um, note that in real life, we can continuously take these measurements, but when you put it in digital form, you have to take each value at a certain uh, sample value. What do I mean by that? For instance, here, although they look continuous, they are constructed from sampling at each second. Now the question is, uh, could we have taken samples at longer time intervals, right? Or with sampling, with larger sampling intervals, or does this process require even smaller sampling intervals? So how fast should we sample a process and grow and do its analysis so that we get a good idea? The, well, there is, of, there is a theory behind that, but in its very simplest term, and this works for most of the cases, we would like to see that that dynamic behavior that you see here clearly. For instance, very probably if we have taken the samples tens of these values, so let me show it in a, another figure. I have all the values also here recorded in memory, not me of course. Uh, okay, so this is the original data sampled at every one second. If I take every 10 seconds, let's see whether they look nice. Yes, as you can see, we can pretty much clearly obtain this, the very same curve here. Note that I have not, I have just used an X here to uh, show because what MATLAB does is actually it draws each of these points that using splines it connects these points. So the, the, the connections are actually MATLAB approximation. In reality, what we obtain are those points, what we have. So even sampling this process for every 10 seconds is pretty much sufficient. So if I had taken a sample at, for instance, every 100 seconds, that would be the result. Now the problem is between this first sample at zero second or the first second and the 100 second, we do not, we cannot see what's going on clearly. Maybe it has done this. It has first, uh, it is a time delay, then it moves faster. We cannot see what's going on clearly. So one way to think about this is it is still out of the scope of the, 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 the experiment maybe, but still it's, it should give you an idea about the whole thing. You should apply a, 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 um, a sampling interval about 
a value which is equal to tau over five to tau over uh, 10. So for instance, although we haven't found the tau value for, from this uh, data, we are not going to find that yet because this is not the step response, as I said, that we are going to obtain. But let's say that if we obtain a tau value of, uh, let's say 50 seconds, right? Then a, a, a tau over five, something like uh, if tau is found to be equal to, let's say 50 seconds, is something like tau over five to tau over 10. So something like 10 seconds to five seconds between those values uh, is pretty much sufficient to draw the response of this system. So heuristically, you would like to see this curvature, this dynamic behavior here. Once you reach the steady state, it's all monotonous, so you don't need to, uh, well, we use usually take constant samples, therefore, it, it, constant sampling intervals, therefore we are going to be again taking these values, but we don't need very um, high frequency sampling here. The most important region is here. So for this question, if you would like to take samples, five to 10 seconds may be um, uh, um, uh, convenient, but only if we assume tau to be equal to 50 seconds, which we cannot do for the timing. These are just preliminary results.